Hello again, everyone, and welcome again to Fifth Avenue Church Online. Hope that you are doing well as we pound our way to Thanksgiving just a few days away. So welcome to it, everybody. Uh, pardon me for a little bit of the script uh, today, but we do have some important information that I want to make sure that I get right. So uh, forgive me in advance, uh, but if you could pay attention for just a second before Tim uh, comes up. Uh, little information regarding small church gatherings uh, and update in our ongoing desire to be good neighbors. And in response to the accelerating spread of COVID-19, we are going to move uh, now to a digital small church gathering format uh, through the holidays. And we'll revisit again as we look at how things are going in our world in early 2021. So to connect, simply go to our website, Fifth Avenue Church. Dot com, and uh, it's got all of the date and time information, and we'll also have a Zoom link uh, there for you, and uh, it's just that easy. You won't even have to sign up like we have been doing uh, in order to participate, and uh, the Zoom gathering is going to be co-hosted by uh, Pastors Joel and Melissa uh, Skinner, and also by the Elliots, uh, Ryan and Sarah, so we encourage you uh, to be involved in that new format that will start this Sunday. Uh, for those of you that have been part of Fifth Avenue Church uh, for a long time, you're very aware that we've been involved annually during the holidays with the tremendous uh, ministry of Angel Tree, uh, which is an outreach to the families of those that are incarcerated in prison. And uh, our own Brandy Selby is helping to lead the charge for us. And uh, this year, Angel Tree is going to be uh, all virtual and very easy to navigate, again, using our website uh, simply go to our website, look for the link, and uh, there's an access code. And then for a flat rate of $22 uh, per kid, uh, that will get them uh, not only cover the expenses, but will get them all a, a $20 uh, Walmart gift card. And if you would like to give one of those gift cards as well to the caregiver, whether it be a parent or whether it be a guardian, uh, you will have the option to do that as well. So we encourage you again to visit our website and to be involved in that tremendous work and select as many kids as you want to support. Also want to encourage you for those that are looking for ways that you can really make a difference uh, right now in the midst of the ongoing pandemic and some of the other issues of our world. Uh, we've been involved with Bloodworks Northwest in the past. We've uh, hosted a blood mobile, and of course, we can't do that right now. But uh, we just got an update from them today about the critical need that our community is experiencing. Uh, it's the highest blood and platelet uh, shortage uh, since COVID-19 was declared an emergency last March. And so they just wrote uh, uh, with a plea uh, to organizations and individuals. They need, uh, on average, a thousand donors a day just to keep up with the current need. And again, they have everything dialed in to where it's going to be very, very safe. But they do have uh, some rules uh, for you. Uh, of course, you have to wear a mask. And anybody 16 and under can't come with you uh, to that appointment. But you can make a private appointment. And again, our website has got information uh, regarding that. And you can set up an appointment. And we really encourage you uh, right now to take advantage of that. Uh, finally, uh, you'd be encouraged, you'll be encouraged to know that our church has been involved in assisting with the ongoing relief efforts uh, specific to the holiday farm fire and COVID-19. To date, we've assisted uh, with housing for a couple of families and uh, providing household needs, even a full truckload uh, to one particular family, of course, that lost everything. And uh, we also, just this last week, provided sleeping bags for homeless teenagers. Uh, right now in our city, there's a lack of resources and lack of ability for some of the regular things like the Egan Warming Center for the teenagers and so on. And so we're looking for ways to assist in our community. And uh, some of you have been so generous uh, to give, and we still have some money that we're continuing to give to those needy areas. And so I thought you would be encouraged by that. So again, happy Thanksgiving, everybody. And here comes Tim and a special guest. Hello, everybody. So glad you could be with us today. We're going to do something a little different. Before I preach, I'm going to preach today, so you stick around. But before I preach, I want to introduce you to my good friend, Nicole Butler. 
We are going to be interviewing some people in the next few weeks and months so that we can put faces and names to, and stories all together to help us connect to one another on a deeper level. So I've asked Nicole to come up here, and she's probably a little bit perturbed at me because she's nervous, okay? But she can do this. I know you can do this. So she's going to come up here and just tell you her story. Just enjoy this. You're going to love her. Nicole, come on up. Hi everyone, thanks Tim for having me. When Tim first asked me to speak, I, I think I made up an excuse or I said no. Um, I like second graders and so t speaking with adults makes me a little bit nervous so I'll try to um, get on with my message. I'm Nicole as Tim said and I'm a second grade teacher in the Bethel School District at Irving Elementary. I've taught there for 15 years. I'm also a member of the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians, which is one of our Oregon tribes, our federally recognized tribes in Oregon. We have over 5,000 members, believe it or not. When I teach my second graders about Native Americans like we're doing now, um, I always get the question, what? Indians are still here today? So hopefully you're having these conversations with your kids if you have school-aged kids. And I'm also a member of the San Carlos Apache tribe, which is a tribe in Arizona. Um, my grandmother, when she left her reservation, she spoke almost no English, and so I love telling that um, because she shared with us so many important parts of her culture, and I, again, share with my kids and my students in my classroom. I um, pride myself on focusing um, on culturally responsive teaching in the classroom, and that's a strength of mine. And um, Tim wanted me to share that I'm also a distant relative, a very distant relative of Geronimo. So when we tell our family and friends that story, um, some of them, you should see their reactions, truly. Um, but we're really proud of him because he protected his people and he fought for what he believed in. So um, when Tim asked me to speak, I was thinking about um, where I wanted this message to go. And I just wanted to share that, um, oh yeah, he also wanted me to share, I'm also the 2021 Oregon Teacher of the Year. And I'm just continuing to learn what that means. Doors are opening, and it's been an amazing journey so far. So I'm really proud of that title as well. But what a year to experience it in with COVID and distance learning. So all of you parents out there who are navigating Zoom learning, keep it up, you're doing great. Um, but really my message is that um, if I can do anything, I'm in the education field, if I can support you in any way, um, I'd love to share stories with you about my culturally responsive work, my equity teaching, my equity lens. Um, if you have a question about one of the tribes in Oregon or how to introduce those topics, how to um, talk about land acknowledgement, that's something that's a strength of mine too, thinking about the land that we're on currently. Um, at one time belonged to indigenous people and um, the Kalapuya tribe is a tribe that we continue to honor in my family. So um, I've loved my time here with all of you. I've worked in the um, children's ministry for about 10 years. I can't believe it. Um, now I'm an old teacher um, and I really love the work that we put um, in getting to know our families and um, making the lessons relevant. So it's been so fun to connect with your children. And I'm excited to see what 2021 holds. I know I spoke with Lily last week, and we have some good ideas in the works. And I'm just really proud to be a part of this congregation. And thank you, Tim, for having me. Um, I look forward to connecting with um, many of you at different times. So take care. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicole. You are going to love the people that we're going to interview. And you should um, make it a point when we relaunch in in-person services. I hope you'll get to know as many people as you can because we got some cool people here, including you. But now it is sermon time. We are cruising through the book of Philippians and the book of Philippians is actually a letter that was written to a small church in the city of Philippi in Greece. And it was written by a young, um, very aggressive church leader named the Apostle Paul. And last week we looked at a few verses that all centered around the topic of complaining and ouch, that one hurt a little for me. That's a, a, a topic that stuck pretty close to home for me. Today, we're going to look at a topic that's the polar opposite of that. We're going to look at a few verses that center on the topic of rejoicing. So let me read for you right now out of uh, Philippians chapter 3 and chapter 4, just verse 1 out of chapter 3 and verse 4 out of chapter 4. It says this, finally, people, Rejoice in the Lord. It is no trouble for me to write the same things to you again, and it is a safeguard for you. More on that later. 
And then in chapter 4, Paul writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. I'd like to go over the what, the when, and the how of rejoicing with us today. Let's start with the what. We are told in this, these verses to rejoice, but that's not a word we use commonly. So what does that word mean? Well, most of the New Testament's written in Greek, so I looked up the Greek meaning, the original meaning of the word rejoice, and it's the Greek word chiro. It's actually pronounced very gutturally, chiro, but I didn't want to say that all day today because it sounds like I'm hawking up a loogie, okay? So we're just going to go with chiro, okay? And it means, chiro, means exactly what you think it would mean. It means to have joy, to be glad. But it's a stubborn, deep-seated kind of joy that doesn't depend on our circumstances. It's also a gift. Joy isn't something we have to work up on our own. We don't have to create it in our inner self. Joy, according to the book of Galatians, is a gift that's deposited into our souls by God, and it's planted there, and it's nurtured by God. So we don't have to wake up every morning and click our heels together like Dorothy on The Wizard of Oz and say, I will be joyful, I will be joyful, I will be joyful. We don't have to do that. It's a gift. We just have to operate in the use of that gift. And by the way, a little fun fact for you here too. The word Cairo is actually the name of a very yummy stew that they eat a lot in the nation of Bolivia. Evidently, it's so good that it just makes you happy. Okay, just a fun fact. But to fully understand the meaning of this fun Greek word Cairo, we can't just know what it is. We have to know what it isn't. And what it isn't is a form of denial. Cairo, rejoicing, does not mean denial. And yet sometimes that's how rejoicing is presented to us, especially within church circles. For us, the phrase rejoice in the Lord always is the spiritual equivalent of, hey, don't worry, be happy. It's kind of denial dressed up in its Sunday best. People don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear that at all. They're like, hey, do not tell me to put on my rose-colored glasses and prance my way through life with a perma-smile on my face, pretending that everything is hunky-dory in my life, especially this year, because it's not. My rose-colored glasses have shattered and poked me in the eyeballs. To rejoice in the Lord is not about denial, and it's not dishonest. To rejoice always is actually to admit that life has its problems and hardships. It's to admit that life can be cruel and unfair at times. But it's also to recognize that there's something else going on in this life, something that is deeper and more profound and more real than our difficulties. A light is shining into our lives, and the darkness cannot extinguish that light no matter how dire our circumstances get. It's a paradox, really. Delight and difficulty exist at the same time in our lives. They exist at the same times. And to rejoice is to see that and to choose joy in spite of our difficulties. I read a book. I don't even remember the author's name, but I read it because I loved the title right after I was out of college. And it was go, called, You Gotta Keep Dancing. And I, I read it just because of the title, but it, it profoundly changed me because it was about a guy that was climbing a mountain. And he had an accident while he was climbing this mountain, and he fell into this deep crevasse. But he landed on his feet, and he was so excited at first. He thought, I'm alive. It didn't kill me. I landed on my feet. How fortunate am I? But because of the adrenaline coursing through his body, he didn't feel the pain that was coming his way later. And when the adrenaline wore off, he was in intense pain. And he lived in intense pain for a long, long time because little did he know when he landed on his feet, his vertebrae compressed. And if you've ever had back problems, you know the kind of pain that can bring. And he had that in spades. But he said something in the middle of all this pain while he was authoring this book. He said something I'll never forget. He said, pain is inevitable. But misery is optional. And I've said that to you before because it's so good. Pain is inevitable, but misery is optional. He saw that in his life, delight and difficulties were there simultaneously, but he chose delight. That's what he did. Yeah, 
we've got to keep dancing. We've got to keep rejoicing. It's not denial. Joy is actually a choice we make. But that takes us to the next word that we're going to look at today, the word when. So if joy is a choice that we can make, if pain is inevitable but misery is optional, we don't have to choose misery. We can actually choose joy. When do we rejoice? Well, according to the Apostle Paul, he says the when is always. And that sounds so crazy and counterintuitive to me. And I'm sure it does to you too, especially in this year that we're living through. The year 2020, and it looks like part of 2021, is going to be like this giant squid of awfulness that makes us want to scream into our pillows on a nightly basis. So I tried to look for a loophole for us. Again, the New Testament's written primarily in Greek. So I looked up that word always, thinking maybe it doesn't mean always. Maybe it means like sometimes or every once in a while in the original language. Well, I looked it up, and it's the Greek word pentote, And what it means is all the time. (laughs) So there's no loophole for us here whatsoever. We're invited to rejoice all the time in the Lord. But here's the cool part. Evidently, it is possible for every human being on this planet to become the kind of person that actually can rejoice in the Lord always. We can. Because in another letter that Paul wrote to a different church, a church in another area in Thessalonica, He wrote to some believers there and he said of them, you rejoiced in great affliction. He was so proud of them because they chose to rejoice even though their lives weren't going well at all. Paul himself was known as being a person that would sing worship songs even when he was locked up in some dank jail cell somewhere. Yeah, in fact, he penned these words, rejoice in the Lord always when he was locked in a jail cell and he was fearing that he was going to be executed and he was facing bitter opposition by some really nasty rivals. He wasn't just telling us to rejoice in the Lord always. He was living out his very advice, his very words. And here's another great example. (coughs) Excuse me. Another great example of a person that lived out these words. I want to tell you about a guy named Martin Rinkhart. If you're a history buff, you might know about him, but I kind of doubt it. He was a pastor in Germany in the 1600s. And being a pastor in Germany in the 1600s was not easy. He was pastoring in an incredibly difficult period of history. The 30 years war was raging around him. Add on top of that the fact that the bubonic plague had descended on the nation of Germany. Eight million people died of the bubonic plague in Germany alone, including, catch this, Martin Rinkhart's beloved wife. So there's his situation. There's an awful war going on. There's an awful plague going on, and he just suffered the loss of the person closest to him in the world. And during this time, he wrote a song. And the title of the song is, Now Thank We All Our God. Can you believe that? Now thank we all our God. Not now complain we all to our God, but now thank we all our God. Check out a few lines of the song. I'll put them on the screen next to you. He writes this. Now thank we all our God with hearts and hands and voices who wondrous things hath done in whom the world rejoices who from our mother's arms hath blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love and still is ours today. Ah, oh, that just floored me when I read this. We can be a person that rejoices in the Lord always, in good times, in mediocre times, in bad times, and even in horrifically bad times. You gotta keep dancing. And that leads us to our final word today, how. So how do we become the kind of people who can rejoice in the Lord always? Because quite frankly, I'm not quite there yet. My circumstances still get the best of me. Well, let me offer a few things to you that you can do and that I'm going to try to do in my own life that will take us to the place where we can become Jedi rejoicers, rejoicing in the Lord always. First of all, focus on God. Paul invites us to rejoice in the Lord, not our circumstances. 
It'd be silly for us to rejoice in our circumstances right now. Well, hallelujah for the pandemic. Yay for all the polarization and isolation that's happening on right now. No, we don't want to do that. That's creepy. The focus of our rejoicing is in the goodness and the wonder of God. And that's a constant source of joy in our life. Second thing we have to do, we get to do rather, is hear the singing. I'm going to have to explain this one. Check out this verse. Oh, what an amazing verse. From the Old Testament book of Zephaniah, who was a prophet. He writes this in chapter 3. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. That's just this picture of perfect peace. And the last line, he will rejoice over you with singing. How cool is that? It will always make you want to rejoice in the Lord when you realize that at that same moment, God is already rejoicing over you. He delights in you so much that he burst into song at the very thought of you. Isn't that great? Third thing we can do, see the rock. I got to explain this one again too. Check out these verses, two verses from the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'll explain this after I read it. They all ate the same spiritual food, and they drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. This is a radical section of scripture. Let me give you the context. These verses refer to a time when Moses was leading the children of Israel out of slavery to Egypt, through the Red Sea, through the desert and wilderness, and to the promised land. As they were wandering through the desert, they became rather desperate and hungry and thirsty. And at one point, they were very thirsty. So Moses strikes a rock that was in the desert, and miraculously, it burst into streams of life-giving water. And a crazy cool miracle. Well, thousands of years later, when 1 Corinthians was written, the Apostle Paul tells us that, yeah, that rock that rock that bursts forth into a miracle of life and life-giving water, that rock was Christ. How cool is that? These people had never even heard of Jesus. They were on the planet thousands of years before Jesus was born, and yet he was with them there in the wilderness, in the desert. Even the barren wasteland was grace occupied by the presence of God. We can rejoice always Because contrary to what our emotions tell us, contrary to what our monkey mind, you know, throws at us with all these random thoughts, Jesus is with us. He is never going to leave us. He never would do that. He is stickier than that. I believe with my whole heart that we're all going to look back on this season of our lives during this pandemic, which has been extremely challenging And we're going to realize that Jesus was with us closer than we ever dreamt he was. Our struggles and our difficulties during this time has blinded us to the truth. It's convinced us that Jesus is far away, maybe even absent. No, he isn't. He is in tenacious solidarity with us. And we can rejoice in that tenacious solidarity. The rock is with us. In that wilderness, you might not be able to feel him right now. You might even be doubting the words I'm saying to you, but they're true. The rock is with us and the rock is Christ. Fourth thing we can do, say goodbye to the goat. This is yet another phrase I'm going to have to explain to you. And there's a holy day in our faith tradition called the Day of Atonement, or it's sometimes called Yom Kippur also. It took place on September 27th of this year. The celebration of this holy day in ancient times was absolutely spectacular. Think Woodstock for all you older people without all the drugs and rock music and sex. Okay, well, actually there's, well, there's some of that, but that's an whole other story, okay? Scholars believe that hundreds of thousands of people would have made their way into the city of Jerusalem for this celebration. And they were there because they had a desire to have their sins removed. And there was a ceremony that ensued that had to do with a goat. And this ceremony for people was a sacred experience. 
they knew that somehow the heavenly realm and the earthly realm were converging during this ceremony. And an important part of the ceremony involved this goat. And the goat was called the scapegoat. We've heard that phrase before. Or, or actually in Hebrew, it was called azazel. Remember that word, azazel. It means to take away. Now, understand people back then. They didn't operate in definitions. They operated in, in visual pictures. That's how they understood great truths. So the priest, when he came forward to perform this ceremony with the scapegoat, he didn't give people a pithy three-point sermon about how their sins are forgiven. Instead, he did a visual demonstration that proved to them that their sins were forgiven. And the demonstration was this. The priest brought in the scapegoat in front of hundreds of thousands of people, placed his hand on the goat's head, and he confessed his sins and all the people's sins and wickedness and placed them, along with his hands, on the goat's head. And everybody was witness to this. Then tradition has it that a red cord was tied around the goat's head. Then um, a very, very responsible person led the goat into the wilderness and released it into the wilderness. And it was a vivid visual picture for the people of the truth that was happening in their souls. God was forgiving them. Their sins were being taken away. They were released from them. They were truly, truly forgiven. And by the way, the person that led that goat into the wilderness they had to really trust that person. He had to take it to a place where it was going to be released forever. Because the last thing you wanted, after all these people had heard that their sins were forgiven, they watched this goat leave town. The last thing you wanted was that goat to wander back <laughs> into town a couple of days later. So people would look at it and go, oh, I thought I was forgiven, but my sins are back. Okay, So that guy had to be very, very trustworthy. But let's move forward now to the time of Jesus. Jesus died on the cross. As he was being led to the cross, one thing that happened was a crown of thorns was jammed onto his head, and it would have penetrated the skin around his forehead area. And if you've ever uh, had a cut or any kind of wound in your head area, your head bleeds like a sieve, like a faucet being turned on. That's why I hope I never lose all my hair. I cut my head open so much growing up. I have so many scars and dents and divots up there. It would look like a topographical map of the moon, my head would. But your head, and I know from firsthand experience, bleeds significantly. So Jesus would have had red all around his head, the red of his own blood, similar to the cord, the red cord, that was tied around the forehead of the scapegoat. And then Jesus was led outside of the city to, of Jerusalem to be crucified, just like the journey the scapegoat made. The scapegoat was led out of the city of Jerusalem into the wilderness. And as he was going, the crowds cried out a lot of things like crucify him, crucify him towards Jesus. But one of the things they also cried out, and you can read about this in the gospel accounts of it, is Take him away, take him away. And that's, there's that word again, Azazel. That's the name of the scapegoat, all right? So the message for all of us is crystal clear. Jesus is our scapegoat. He's the one that takes away our sin. We are forgiven. Our slate is clean. So when you start to think about things from your past and they bring up this this renewed sense of guilt and shame. Remember, the goat is gone. Your sins have disappeared. You are forgiven. If you start to pray and you're thinking, I'm not sure God can really forgive me of this. This is probably too big for him. This is probably a deal breaker. He's going to say, oh, I can forgive a lot, but that's too much. No, the goat is gone and it's not coming back. All of the darkness that we sometimes bring to the table is no match for the light that God brings to the table. His ability to forgive us is far greater than our ability to screw things up. The goat is gone. You should probably say that to someone right now. Jay's sitting right over here. I'm going to say to you, Jay, the goat is gone. He's saying it to me right now too, and it's true. Now, these are just the few of the things that we can do that will help us to become Jedi-level rejoicers 
And it's important that we do. I was thinking this week, just randomly, of this old Saturday Night Live skit that starred Will Ferrell and the, and the band, the rock group that was famous in the 80s, Blue Oyster Cult. And they had a song at the time called Don't Fear the Reaper. It's a super cool song, by the way. And Will Ferrell's part in this skit was to play the cowbell in the song. And the main gist of the skit was, hey, this song's cool and all, but it'd be way better with more cowbell. In fact, just Google that, more cowbell, and that's what you'll get. And it was a lot funnier than I'm making it sound. Well, our world right now would be so much better, not with more cowbell, it would be so much better with more rejoicing. And that starts with us. It starts with us, the followers of Jesus, becoming Jedi rejoicers. And not only will we make the world better, we'll make our own lives better too. Because the Apostle Paul says in this section, rejoicing is a safeguard for you. A safeguard. And I found that to be so true in my life. Rejoicing in the Lord keeps me safe from cynicism. It keeps me safe from despair. It keeps me safe from discouragement and hopelessness. It really does. When you were younger, you were probably told that your blankie would keep you safe from the boogeyman. That's totally not true. Your parents lied to you, okay? Because a blankie is no match for even a beginning boogeyman. A blankie is really not a good safeguard. But rejoicing is, it works. It keeps the doom and gloom at bay because it centers us on the non-anxious presence of God in our life. So instead of more cowbell, as good a motto as that was, our motto should be more Cairo. That's what it should be. Let me pray for us right now. Mm. God, we truly want to become people who are Jedi rejoicers, people who rejoice in you, not just often, not just sometimes, not just when we feel good, but always. So please remind us that our rejoicing is never dependent on our circumstance. We need not let our difficult silence us. We can rejoice as we focus on you as we sense you singing over us, as we recognize the reality of your nearness, your tenacious solidarity with us, and as we wave goodbye to the goat, basking in the joy of being people whose sins are forgiven, whose slates are wiped clean. And let our rejoicing make the world a better place, and let our rejoicing keep the doom and gloom at bay in our own lives. Thank you, Lord. Rejoicing is a choice, but it's also a gift from you. We love you, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me here today. We're going to finish up the book of Philippians next week. I'm excited about that. And then we're going to launch into a three-week series on the topic of Christmas. We're going big at Christmas time this year. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving week, too. God bless you. Have a great week.